Hello, and welcome back to Sociology 101. For those who tuned in last time, you know we started examining the cross-examination from my uh, Romans 9 debate with uh, James White. And of course, as always, I was long-winded, so I broke it up into two parts. Here is part two of that discourse. But before we play that discourse, I do want to remind you to go to sociology101.com. If you can sign on to be a patron, a supporter of the broadcast, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, if you're considering a higher education, we highly recommend Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary, which you can find out more information about by clicking on the classroom link there at Sociology 101. And if you can help us in any way, we would greatly appreciate it. So here is the second part of the examination of the cross-examination with Dr. James White. Okay. So if he had, then God would have had to have found someone else other than Paul. Well, I'm not denying God's foreknowledge. I'm not denying God's abilities to know his, what his plans are. And again, so if God knew, the philosophical... then he couldn't have, right? Okay, this is where it gets into the philosophical, and I defer to William Lane Craig to t debate with him. And I probably should have just said there's a don't conflate, uh, the, don't com com commit the modal fallacy of conflating certainty with necessity. Just something that's certainly known does, is not necessary, is not necessarily determined. Um, and just because we acknowledge the certainty of God's foreknowledge of that which uh, men will choose to do does not mean that the choice in itself isn't libertarianly free. Um, and that's, again, one of the philosophical mistakes that I think Calvinists make is a modal fallacy of inflating uh, certainty with necessity. Just because something certainly is known doesn't mean it's, it's necessitated or determined by God, the one who knows it. Knowledge in and of itself is not causal. It doesn't cause it. And so we go over that, and it gets a little bit um, long and philosophical. So let's skip ahead to the next learning point. We won't. Um, you, you said that you can't trust a God who has two wills. Uh, God said thou shalt not murder, right? Correct. Is that the will of God? Yes. Um, in Acts 4, 27 and 28, was the early church wrong to pray and to confess that what Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Jews and the Romans did, God's hand and purpose predestined to occur, which was specifically the murder of the only innocent man uh, who has ever lived? Yeah, I, I wrote a blog article on this, the three main texts that Calvinists often refer to, um, Genesis chapter 50, the selling of the brothers, um, obviously Israel um, um, uh, being hardened as, as Pharaoh was hardened is a big one, um, and then again, the, the crucifixion of Christ. And as I've reminded in my podcast and other places, we do believe God determines some things. God does step into human history, and very similar to, to what maybe even compatibilistic arguments are in how God works these things out through judicial hardening, that he brings about his purpose. So he blinds the Israelites in order to do what? To ensure the crucifixion. And so, yes, God does determine some things, but it's for a redemptive purpose, like the, like the, hide, like the cop hiding himself. It's for the redemptive plan. It's not to condemn them because they too could be saved. It's not, it's not a, a condemning from birth to death. Was Herod condemned for his actions in the death of Christ? I would assume so. Pontius Pilate? I would assume so, yes. Was it eternally God's intention for the cross to take place? Well, I think the word intention gets misapplied um, because when we, we say intention, I, you talk about God having the intention of the evil happening, where I talk about God's redemptive intention in the evil happening. And so there's a distinction. Michael Brown and you go around and around about this too, where God is redeeming a, an evil for good, and he's, he's, in, he's taking their evil intention and turning it around. He's redeeming that evil intention for a good thing. And in his meticulous providence, he's able to do that, but in, in his sovereign, sovereign abilities, he's able to do that. But that doesn't mean, from my perspective, that we deny human responsibility in the ability to respond and make ch real choices within time and space. Let, let me try it again. Was it God's intention from eternity that the Son of God become incarnate and die upon Calvary's tree. Okay, so let me, let me pull this out of the religious analogy and use the cop analogy that I, I referenced there that y'all have heard me talk about here quite often with the sting of a police department. A police department uh, has already criminal, crim, criminal minds in their city, and they set up a sting operation to try to catch the notorious drug dealers in their town. And so a cop goes undercover, and he, he, his intention is to keep secret his identity. Um, his intention is good. It's noble. He's trying to stop drugs. But yet he acts within the plans of already criminal people to bring about an actual drug deal on a particular day at a particular place. Um, and so if the police officers can, and the police department can somehow be shown 
to intend for criminals to act in a criminal way at a particular point in time within the sting operation, that that somehow proves determinism, i.e. That, that the cops determine all crimes at all times. You can see how that's a non sequitur. It just doesn't follow that because the cops use the already criminal actions and intentions of criminals in their city to bring about a drug deal for the sting operation, that somehow proves that that um, that cops are responsible for in, in bringing about through those same kinds of that same kind of planning every single drug deal that happens at all times, that that makes it more obvious, right? Well, that's what Calvinists have done with the crucifixion, for example. They they've taken a point in time where God has used already criminal people, the Pharisees, already cr- uh, hardened and calloused, and He cuts them off. He blinds them in that calloused rebellion. In other words, hides His identity from them, much like a police officer in a sting operation hide His identity. Why? So as to bring about that that crucifixion for a redemptive good. So His intention is good in using already criminal activities. Now, in the same way, it's a, it's a non sequitur to conclude that cops bring about all crimes. It's also non sequitur to say, well, because of what God did in the crucifixion proves that God brings about all crimes, all sin, in the same meticulous way. And that's the problem with the Calvinistic worldview, is that they've got God ultimately determining the desires and intentions of sinners at all places at all times based upon proof text which are proving that God uses already criminal minds to bring about a one particular, uh, particularly sinful deed so as to bring redemption for all the sins. So, listen, proof that God is bringing about redemption and, and uses already criminal minds to do that is not proof that God has determined all crime that takes place or all sin that takes place. But that's exactly the argument that, that Calvinist and, and that White is making here. I don't think you answered that question. Well, I was defining the word intention. And All right. Yes, use, would, if you'd right. like to use, was it his will? Was it the, the, in, the choice of the triune God? Use whatever term you wish. But did God intend in eternity past for the second person of the Trinity to enter into flesh and die upon yes. Calvary's tree? And, and that's what I was attempting to answer in saying that proof that God uses determinative, if you want to call him that, determinative means to bring about the redemption of all mankind does not prove that God also uses deterministic means to bring about all the sins that need redeeming. That's my argument, is that sometimes people look at Calvary and they say, well, God used determinative means to bring about Calvary, so he must have brought about all the sin that was being redeemed at Calvary. And that, that to me, is a, a gross overstatement of what the cross is. The cross is called by Calvinists the worst evil of all time, but the Bible never calls it the evil. The Bible calls it redemption. God is giving up his own life. He's stepping in. He's self-sacrificially giving himself, much like— So to use our analogy again, we, we, would, we would say on one hand, the, the, the sting operation, the selling of the drugs in that sting operation is evil because the people are, who are doing it, the, the criminals in the room who are doing it, are evil and have evil intentions in doing what they're doing. But the cop that's hiding doesn't have evil intention. He's using their evil intentions to bring about a good action for his uh, a redemptive good. Now, all analogies fall short, obviously, when we're talking about the redemption of man uh, through Calvary. So yes, you could say on one side, yes, God had the intention of bringing about redemption through free moral actions of criminals. So that doesn't prove that those actions weren't free in the libertarian sense of the word. It only proves that God used those actions, not effectually caused them, not decreed them where they couldn't have done otherwise, but that he knows because his knowledge is certain and he uses those actions as for a redemptive purpose. That's the point. Paul expresses at the beginning of this chapter, willing to sacrifice himself for the sake of his brethren. That is, that is time. At this time, it's going to be time for Dr. White to come up and give... Okay, let's fast forward to the next uh, cross-examination here. Dr. White, you critique a lot of my methods, but you didn't answer the arguments that I was really hoping that you would get to, and presumably since I covered so little of Romans 9, when actually I think I went through almost all of the text, all the way up to verse 23 at least, um, it it seems to me that you would have at least made the argument against the distinction between judicial hardening and total inability, because that seemed to be a really sticking point for us. And I was hoping that you would make a presentation to give us a clear distinction between the way Calvinists view the nature of man's ability between their judicial hardened nature and a total disabled or total inability. So you all you remember it from our earlier discourse. This is, this is why I think it's the key, because this is ultimately getting to the T of TULIP, total inability. 
And since there's no distinction with a difference between the the total inability of Calvinism and the judicial harden of Calvinism, at least as far as their, their capacity is concerned, in other words, their moral capacity is both hardened, dead inability, um, and I'm asking for the distinction. And let's see if he finally gives that distinction. Well, if we want to move into that area of discussion, that's fine. Um, I, I do. Okay, good. Um, the Bible teaches very— and, and he critiques me after this debate about this being irrelevant. I thought we were going to be about Romans 9. Romans 9. How is hardening of Israel and the nature of man not relevant to Romans 9 and how we interpret it? When you're talking about God hardening a nation, blinding them, sending them a spirit of stupor, all which is contained within Romans 9, how is that not relevant to our discussion? And yet he seems to be perturbed that I would even ask this question. But yet this is the heart of how you approach, the premise of how you approach Romans 9. Because if your premise is total inability of man from birth due to the nature of Adam that they inherited, then you're going to interpret Romans 9 like a Calvinist. If your premise, however, is that Israel is being hardened because of their free choice to rebel and to reject the things of God, and now they're being cut off in their unbelief and their rebellion, then you you come away with my interpretation. So this is at the very root. This is to the very premise of how you approach Romans 9, and yet he seems put off both here and in, in later discourses that this is even being discussed. Like it's, it's a totally irrelevant to talk about total inability and hardening. Um, how, how is that irrelevant when you're approaching uh, Romans 9? Very plainly, Romans chapter 8, those who are according to flesh cannot do what is pleasing to God. I fundamentally believe that that is consistent with the biblical teaching from the Psalter that we are born as sinners, we are born as enemies of God, we are... Uh, okay, and again, touching on Romans 8, proof that you cannot fulfill the demands of the law, which is what Romans 8 says, and that you can't please God when your mind is in the flesh, does not prove that you can't respond positively to the Spirit when He calls and when he calls you to be reconciled from your breaking of the law. Again, it's a non sequitur. It just doesn't follow. Proof that you can't fulfill the demands of the law doesn't prove that you can't admit that fact in light of the gospel, and you can't put your faith and, tr and trust in Christ. And yet they continue to go back to those proof texts, proof that you can't earn righteousness by works of the law, to prove you also can't believe in Christ for your own righteousness. And again, this does not follow. Uh, dead in our trespasses and sins, we have hearts of stone. So we're born hardened. We have hearts of stone. Okay, so I'm pushing on this point because I'm trying to get to the distinction with a difference. Um, and again, that might have been sounded like I was rude because I'm interrupting his answer, but I'm, he's, he's saying we have hearts of stone. And I'm trying to say from birth, from birth, because that's what, what you seem to be saying. We have hearts of stone from birth, meaning we're hardened already from birth. And yet you er argued earlier, there's a distinction between the hardened one and uh, natural man. Where's that distinction? We're born judicially hardened. That, you know, if I did this, you would have you would have complained. But let me let me just just move on from that. I'm just trying to find a there distinction. is a difference, sir, as you should have known as a Calvinist, between the judicial judicial well, hardening <laughs> upon an, a, a a people, upon a nation, for example, uh, to harden uh, the, a king so that his his nation can be can be destroyed, because certainly, man, Pharaoh could have really saved his life if he had just simply. Uh, let the people go. God had a purpose. He hardens them. There is judicial hardening that is not the same thing as simply being a fallen son, a daughter, a daughter of Adam. And when you say we have certain capacities, sir, as a Calvinist, you should have known, of course. We okay, so he keeps referring to, oh, well, as a Calvinist, you should have known this. Calvinist, you should have known that. And of course, I don't know if you heard my comment, but what I was saying there in commentary is the reason I left Calvinism is because of this very issue and the fact that you're not answering it is even more proof of the reason I left Calvinism, is that you're not showing a distinction between uh, the capacity of a natural-born son of Adam and a judicially hardened Jew. You're, you're not showing any distinction. You're just assuming they're the same. Both of them are completely morally incapable of responding to the, the law. And it's like what, what I refer to with the children later in, in this discourse, is that why did Jesus pull up a child and say, you must humble yourself like this child in order the kingdom of enter the kingdom of heaven. What, why, why does his youth have anything to do with it under, under Calvinism? He's, he's either elect or he's not. He's either been regenerate or he, he hasn't been. Um, the only reason you would pull up a child is if you believed a child is humble, moldable, able to learn, able to listen versus the old wineskins who are set in their ways and can't take on new wine and have grown calloused and hardened and self-righteous. That's the distinction between the two. The older one is more set in his ways. He's not moldable. He's hardened clay. He's not moldable clay, new, fresh clay. The young child is able to learn, able to listen. 
that doesn't mean he's not sinful. He's still fallen short of God's glo- glory. That's why he can't confuse righteousness, which is by the law, which the child is not, versus a righteousness, which is by faith, which the child is per- perfectly capable of doing. He's perfectly capable of believing the gospel message brought to him. He's perfectly capable of putting his trust in Christ. He's not capable of earning righteousness through works. That's the distinction. And James won't uh, touch on that clearly. We do. We have all sorts of capacities, but they are all determined by the fact that we are enemies of God and slaves to sin. And Jesus. So being a slave to sin means, under the Calvinistic system, that you're incapable, morally speaking, you're morally incapable of confessing that you're a slave and putting your trust in another. But where does the Bible say that? Chapter verse, where does the Bible say being a slave to sin equals the incapacity, morally speaking, to admit your slavery, your bondage, and put your trust in someone who's offering you help. Because that's what he's ultimately doing by referring to being a slave to sin. The Bible also says we as Christians are slaves to righteousness. Does that mean we can't sin or we can't desire to sin or we can't choose to sin? Of course not. Being a slave to something doesn't mean you're incapable of being tempted by and drawn into the other. It just simply means that as a slave to something, you're saying, I am giving ownership. My, uh, my ownership is in that. doesn't mean I can't be tempted by or drawn by something that I'm not a slave to, or I can't be offered help to be, to be released from that bondage or that slavery, uh, especially with regard to sin. Jesus Christ taught that unless the Son sets you free, you will never be free. And so there needs to be a... Yeah, and he will set you free. You believe in him, trust in him, and he will set you free. Truth will set you free. Those who hold to my teachings, Jesus said, will be set free. And in other words, the truth will set you free. Okay, so which is first? You hold to my teachings, Jesus said. And then he goes on to say, and the truth will set you free. Those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, though they have the truth, it's right there for them, if they suppress the truth and unrighteousness, then they won't be set free. They'll continue in their slavery to the sin because they're denying the truth that would set them free. If you accept the truth, it sets you free. If you suppress the truth, it won't. It's it's really that simple. Divine action to set us free. A slave does not choose to become free. Even he may humble himself as much as he wants, but unless the sun sets you free, you will remain in slavery. And so we do recognize the difference between... So you have to be set free to admit you're a slave. It's just like the cart before the horse. It's like you've got to be given a new heart to admit you have a bad heart. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, if I say, Lord, I have a bad heart. Well, no, you don't. Leighton, you don't have a bad heart. I've already given you a good heart. Oh, so I already have a good heart? Yeah, you wouldn't be praying, admitting you have a bad heart, unless I'd already given you a good heart. See, (laughs) it doesn't make sense. You admit you have a bad heart, as Ezekiel 18 says. Rid yourself of your offenses and make yourselves a new heart. In other words, confess so as to get a new heart. Just like with a heart surgeon, the heart surgeon gives you the diagnosis. You have a corrupt heart. Allow me to, 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 um, to uh, take you into surgery and to give you a new heart. You have to submit to the knife of the surgeon. You have to say, yes, I agree with you and your diagnosis. I have a corrupt heart. I need a new one. And in doing so, you get a new heart. The, the, they have it backwards. The, 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 the surgeon had to slip into your bed while you're sleeping, put you out, cut you open, give you a new heart. Then you'll wake up and you'll go, doctor, you're right. I have a bad heart. Can you change me? Can you give me a new heart? Guess what? I, you don't know it, but I slipped in and actually already gave you a new heart. And that's the only reason you admit that you have a bad heart. It, it, it's just the cart before the horse. And it's exactly what he's doing here. You have to be set free in order to admit you're in slavery. Okay. I wish it worked that way. I wish that I, my, my sins and the bondage of my sins would just been dropped off of me before I confessed them, but they don't. I still have the addictions. I still have the problems when I'm confessing that I'm addicted. Just like with an alcoholic that we've talked about before, an alcoholic may not be able to stop drinking. And it may be true. He's a slave to drunk, to, to drink. He's a slave to alcohol, but doesn't mean he can't check himself into a rehab facility and admit his addiction. Does it? Wouldn't it be nice that he has to be freed? Uh, like somehow he's freed from his addiction to admit that he's addicted. Is that, is that the way it works? Is that alcoholic go, oh, I just don't desire alcohol anymore. I'm addicted to alcohol because I know that I'm not, I know that I was addicted before, but now I'm not addicted. And so I can admit that I'm not addicted because he's freed me from my desire for alcohol. No, you confess your desire. You confess your addiction. You confess your bondage so as to be freed. You're not freed so as to admit your addictions, to admit your bondage. Just cart before the horse. Between the two. 
And it's not a, dis a distinction without a difference unless you're simply saying, well, you're saying that everyone has an, an inability to uh, do what is good before God. Yes, that's exactly what we are saying, but that's not the same thing. Right, so if your inability to do anything that's good before God means I can't admit my badness, <laughs> because that's the definition of good for a Calvinist is to admit you're not good, um, when really what he means by goodness, righteousness, it means meriting salvation, earning salvation through the works of the law. And when you have conflated those two things and make them into one, then you've got their error. And so what he's saying is, well, no one can do what's good. That means everybody is unable to see, hear, understand, and admit their badness, um, admit their sin, and, and, and so as to be healed, which is the exact same condition as the hardened person. So where have you drawn a distinction between the natural man and the hardened man? You still have not. Same thing as judicial hardening. There are a lot of people who claim to be former Arminians who still ask questions because, not because they might not know the answer to it, but because they are pushing on a point they know is weak. And so that's the, the reason for cross-examination. In a previous debate, you were asked about why God hardened men's hearts and why Jesus needed to use parables in order to prevent the Pharisees from coming to faith and being healed if total inability is true. For example, Mark 4, the disciples asked Jesus why he spoke to them in parables, and he answered, to you it has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those on the outside, they get everything in parables so that while seeing, they may not perceive, by while hearing, they may not hear, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. Your answer was, in part, he was preventing a false conversion. But what in this text, specifically from this text, when it says they might turn and be forgiven, what in that text leads you to believe he's speaking of a false conversion? Okay, so real quickly for background, for people who don't understand this, uh, Mark 4 and Matthew 13, this is where the apostles come to Jesus and say, why are you speaking unto them in parables? And he said, to you, the secrets have been given, but to those on the outside, I speak in parables lest they see, hear, turn, and repent, and so as to be healed. In other words, he's blinding them. He's not taking them the message clearly anymore because he's cutting them off in their rebellion so as to accomplish his redemption through them. He's hiding the truth of who he is, much like the police in the sting operation. He's not going to come out and tell them he's a police officer. Otherwise, they're not going to act like criminals. And in the same way, he's hiding the truth from those who are already hardened in their Phariseeism and their self-righteousness as to his identity because he doesn't he wants them to you know to crucify him he has a plan while he's down from heaven so he's entrusted himself to a select few a remnant and those are the ones he's revealing the truth to those are the ones he's not just using parabolic language but to those on the outside it says in verse 34 of mark chapter 4 he only uses parables when speaking to them lest they see hear understand and turn and so what is the purpose of that if total inability is true then that would be like putting a blindfold on a corpse, right? So why would he use parable? What's the purpose of using a parable? If a person is born dead, corpse-like dead like the Calvinists say, then they're, they're incapable of believing that he is the Messiah. They're incapable of accepting that as truth, and therefore um, they wouldn't be needing a, a parabolic language. You wouldn't need a blindfold to put on a corpse. You don't need to put earplugs on a corpse. Why? Because they, they're spiritually dead. They can't see, hear, or understand. And so putting these this parabolic blindfold, so to speak, it seems redundant on Calvinism. It seems to confront the idea of total inability on Calvinism. And that's what I'm trying to push at. And let's see if he answers that. Instead of preventing an actual conversion. And what, what debate was this? Uh, with uh, Stephen Gregg. Oh, I see. So that was just part of my response. That wasn't the whole response. Well, the, the, the gist of it okay. was that you were preventing a, you were well, saying that they were preventing a... The well, gist that you heard was that. Um, well, welcome to Obviously... Uh, okay, and I've played that on another broadcast, so you can go back and listen to the debate with Steve Craig, and that's exactly his answer to Stephen Gregg when he, he asked him this question, um, is, is, well, he preventing a false conversion. Um, he, he knows that these people could would believe in a you know false view of the Messiah, and he's preventing that from happening. And I'm trying to point to the text that says, well, it says they would have repented and been healed. So how can you say this is preventing a false conversion if Paul is quoting a passage that seems to indicate that they could be genuinely converted at this time, even though that would be a wrong time for them to be converted and change because he would not accomplish redemption through their unbelief if they did. So. Where, where's your evidence that it's a false conversion? And it, he seems to kind of deny that that was his actual answer. But again, it's, it's out there and recording for you to listen to if you'd like to. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, uh, obviously the assumption that I'm making is based upon the text of scripture I just gave to you, which I've not heard any responses to thus far. 
And that- when would I have responded to it? <laughs> there was no, there was no uh, presentation between there and there, so I don't know where, where I would have responded to it. That is that we are dead in sin and that Romans chapter 8 says those who according to flesh cannot do what is pleasing to God. And that faith and repentance is... Okay, so he's going over all the things he's already said about total inability, the dead in sin and all those kinds of things. And that's what I'm asking about. If that's true, then why put a blindfold on a dead man? Why speak in parables to dead men? I just don't regenerate them. If you don't regenerate them, they're not going to believe that you're the Messiah. So what's the point? What's the problem? Why, why use parabolic language? It's pleasing to God. These are hypothetical situations that Jesus is presenting to us in regards to why it is that he is graciously giving the truth of the kingdom of God to his disciples, but not to those who are listening, who have all the background in the Bible, they're familiar with the teachings of Scripture, and yet it is not, and you actually, amazingly enough, agree with this, it is not God's intention to have these large crowds uh, truly coming to understand the truth because uh, I, I don't necessarily agree with you about why. I think it has to do with the Messiah issue. It's the same reason why Jesus said to the people who confessed him as Messiah, what does he say to them? Don't tell anyone. Why? Because the result is they have a false understanding of what the Messiah is. So after denying that he says it's about a false conversion, he goes on to make his argument for the false conversion. And the, the answer that he gives here proves that he really doesn't understand traditionalism very well because he says, it's amazing to me that you think that he's not trying to get large crowds to believe in him either. I don't know how that's amazing to, to anybody. Why, why, would, why would Jesus, trying to accomplish the, his own crucifixion, want large numbers of the Jews to come to believe that he's the Messiah? And yeah, some of them have a false view of the Messiah of making him into a conquering hero, but they certainly would not have crucified him. They may have tried to promote him up to be a, you know, their, their conquering hero, but they're certainly not going to crucify him if they believe that he is the, their, their Messiah, the, the long-awaited one. And so him hiding his identity, telling people, as he just referenced, not to tell people who he is, is actually a part of his strategic plan, like a, a police officer in a sting operation, to keep his identity hidden. It's not proof that God doesn't want them to be saved, as the Calvinistic worldview ultimately reads those kinds of texts as, as saying, as we hear from Matt Slick and others who quote Mark chapter 4 as some kind of proof text that God doesn't want those people who are, are, are being uh, hardened and, and uh, spoken to in parables, he doesn't really want their salvation. That's not the case. Um, as we've already said, he's cutting them off and he's blinding them so as to accomplish redemption and ultimately for their provoking of their will by the ministry to the Gentiles so that they too may be saved, as we learn in, in uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 11 and 14 through 14. So that these are the kinds of things that I would love to have hashed out more uh, directly in the debate, but time is uh, you know precious and short. And so, actually, the text says that they might turn and be forgiven. So that's not a false conversion. Well, if someone will turns, conversion. they will be forgiven. It was not God's intention to do that, that with them. He's preventing that from happening. For them, he is, yes. Right. And who's them? Israel. He's Those particular, them. It, uh, again, you, you take a, you're taking a, a general idea that this is all of Israel. It could be specific individuals. I mean, there was a time when these individuals well, sure, he had his end apostles up hearing and those the he entrusted. He was entrusting some to himself. He had his apostles who he was drawing to himself, and he was teaching them, but he was keeping the other ones at a, a distance. Only to them they were entrusted with these teachings. He was, he was blinding the rest purposely for redemption. Well, you say, when you say entrust with these teachings, um, I'm not sure what you mean by that, because you tend to attach that to some kind of apostolic calling or something along those lines. I don't think he's... Well, the apostles are being called, obviously, um, as we see in Acts 10, 41, that he didn't reveal himself uh, to everyone, but to those he has chosen uh, as, mis- as uh, apostles, um, those he's revealed himself to and that he ate with. Um, he, he only gives those the authority to take the message to the rest of the world. Those are the ones he sends out to draw all men to himself by the message of the gospel once he's raised up. As, um, as John 12, 32 alludes uh, to as well, is that all men will be drawn to him once he's lifted up. And so th- these are the kinds of things, again, that, that John, James White never gets any kind of specific, specific, specific answers to. Um, and you can hear it there. You can, you can, th- th- this discourse right here really highlights the way in which James White doesn't really understand and engage with our points of contention by, by saying somehow that we... I mean, he seems to be alluding there that we don't believe it's about the individuals. No, I mean, obviously he chose 12 individuals and he's chosen certain people that he's revealing himself to and he's telling the rest, 
keep it hidden from them. Don't tell them. Don't tell anybody. It's not the right time. Clearly, that's about individuals. But it's not about individuals being elected to effectual salvation. It's about individuals being chosen to carry the message to bless all the families of the earth so that all will be drawn. And, and that's the point uh, that I'm, I'm continue to point out about Calvinism is that they continue to look at passages and contexts that have to do with God's choice of individuals uh, for the purpose of bringing redemption to the world as proof for individual unconditional election to salvation, effectual salvation, no less. He's making a differentiation along those lines at this Paul, point. Um, as he begins the chapter, he wishes he could take the place of his fellow countrymen, yes. which to me sounds a lot like what Jesus did when he went to the cross. But if Calvinism is true, five-point Calvinism anyway, um, then Jesus didn't really want to take the place of the hardened Jews, and Paul did. Likewise, Paul quotes from Moses in Exodus narrative where he too stands in, as one willing to sacrifice himself for the unfaithful Israelites. How is it that Paul and Moses, who are mere men, express more mercy and self-sacrificial love towards people than Jesus, who's inspiring them to write these words? Okay, so a- ask yourself the question when you listen to James White's answer. Does he answer that question? Paul is willing to give himself up for the hardened Jew is Jesus. According to Five Point Calvinism, no, because the hardened Jew represents the reprobate of the Calvinistic worldview. So Jesus is not willing to sacrifice himself for them. But listen to his answer. His answer goes into, well, we don't know who the elect are or who they're not. Does Jesus? <laughs> does, does Paul, if he's writing this passage with the indication of trying to say that the hardened Jew are the reprobates of Calvinism, then isn't he saying that these people aren't loved by God and wanted by God and Jesus didn't die for them if you believe in five-point Calvinism? Does, does White deal with that point? You, you be the judge. Here's his answer. It's a tremendous misunderstanding of not only Calvinism but the, the text itself. And once again, you, you simply are in error to think that Paul is in any way expressing anything here other than, see, you're assuming what you should know we do not assume. We do not know the identity of the elect, sir. What does that have anything to do with it? And did I even make that assumption in my question? No. I just, I simply stated two facts. One, Paul wanted to give himself up for the hardened Jew. And under Calvinism, the the limited atonement view is Jesus did not want to sacrifice himself for the hardened Jew because the hardened Jew represents the reprobate of the Calvinistic worldview. So those are just two facts. No assumptions made about what he thinks people know or don't know as far as from Calvinist and evangelism. I'm not even going there, but yet that's where he takes it. We do not know the identity of the elect. And so we cannot operate upon the foundation of knowing who the elect are and who the, who the elect are not. And therefore, we as followers of Jesus Christ have passion to speak his truth to all people as did the apostle Paul. To come to the idea, as you, you snuck it into your pre-prepared uh, question there, but it was a false assertion that Jesus didn't want to substitute himself for the hardened Jews. So in other words, the false assumption you're inserting there is that for Jesus to be truly, truly loving, grace has to be given to everyone equally. No, not at all. doesn't have to. That's not at all what I said. I said Paul was willing to give himself up for these folks. Jesus was not under five-point Calvinism. Why, why is that? Why is Paul more merciful towards these hardened Jews than Jesus was? That, that's my only question. I said nothing about what Jesus owed. Paul, in my estimation, Paul doesn't even owe that to him. He's being stoned by these people. If, anything, if, if, if anything's fair or just, Paul would go, forget you. I dust my feet off and move on because you guys are trying to throw me into prison. I don't care if you are my countrymen. I don't care if you are related to me. I don't care if we have the same blood. Forget you. That's what Paul should do. That's fair for Paul. But what does Paul do? I will curse myself for their sake if I could. By God is my witness, I would set myself a curse for the sake of my fellow countrymen. That sounds like what Jesus does on our system, not on Calvinism. And do you answer that question? No, you divert. I mean, completely goes off onto what's what's called red herring. It's about evangelism. Oh, you're attacking Calvinist passion for evangelism. Nothing to do with it. Not what I said at all. Didn't have anything to do with that. Oh, no, you're, you're trying to say that God owes people salvation. Oh, God owes everybody salvation. Not at all what I said. Nope. 
Paul doesn't owe grace towards those um, hardened Jews either, but he shows them grace. He shows them love. And my question is, why is Paul and Moses in Exodus 32 and 33 that Paul quotes from, um, why are they being more merciful than the God who's inspiring them to write these words? And does he answer that question? And that's what denies the fundamental teaching of Scripture in regards to grace. So just because, Jesus inter- just because Jesus goes to the cross in the place of the ones that his Father has chosen and that the Spirit is going to regenerate so that there's perfect harmony in the work of the Trinity in the redemption of a particular people is not a foundation for you to then sneak that in and say, oh, but grace has to be given to everyone. Grace does not have to be given to everyone. That's a false, false assertion. That's not the argument that I was making. Grace is given to those whom God chooses to give it to. We just, it's just not a secret who God chooses to give grace to. He doesn't give grace to people uh, chosen for no apparent reason before the world ever began. He gives grace to those who humble themselves and trust in him. That, that, that's the difference. God, God can give grace to everyone, even if they're a, hard, even if they're a, a calloused, um, rebellious Jew who um, is provoked by envy through Paul's ministry and comes back and grafted back in. He can show mercy to even those folks. He can show mercy to the tax collector who falls on his ground and strips and rips his clothes. Even a dirty barbarian Gentile, he can show mercy to them if he wants to. He can show mercy to anyone who has faith because the righteous live by faith. But proof that the righteous live by faith is not proof that no one can live by faith simply on the basis that no one can earn or merit righteousness through the works of the law. For grace to be grace, it must be free. It cannot be demanded, okay. and the assumption of your question was that grace can be demanded. No, the assumption of my question was not that grace can be demanded. The assumption of my question is that Paul showed grace to people who were undeserving of grace, and Jesus didn't on your systematic. Why? Why is he more gracious than Jesus? And you did not answer that question. That's um, where the problem lies. In, in tonight's discussion and in previous discussions over Romans 9, um, with other opponents I've noticed this because I've been listening to all of those, um, I've noticed that you, you don't really attempt to even challenge or refute the Old Testament text or the interpretations, but instead you regularly appeal to what you call the apostolic interpretation of Paul in Romans 9 alone. And by that, you seem to suggest that it doesn't matter what the Old Testament context or meaning was, but that the only thing that really matters is how the apostle interprets it in his day. So my question is twofold. One, how is it that not begging the question to assume without strong evidence that the apostle is actually interpreting the Old Testament text differently than the original context demands? And two, don't you think it weakens Paul's case to suggest that he has to use eisegesis of the Old Testament in order to prop up his new soteriological views? The falsehood of the statement began right at the beginning when you said, I don't try to refute the Old Testament text. You're exactly right. I happen to think the Apostle Paul was plenty good at interpreting the Old Testament, and I will follow after his footsteps. Okay, so he's just, again, stepped right back into begging the question, which is to assume that the apostolic interpretation of the Old Testament is Calvinism. In other words, he's taking the Old Testament text out of its context, even even by Calvinist own admission, they know, hey, oh, yeah, Exodus 32 and 33, when he says, I will have mercy on him, whom I have mercy, he was obviously not talking about God effectually choosing to save some people and to, to reprobate everybody else. It's obviously not the context. It's talking about him choosing to um, uh, not punish the Jews when they deserve to be punished so as to accomplish his promise through them. But that's not what Paul's using it as. Paul's using it as a proof text for Calvinism. Paul's using it to prove that God can effectually demonstrate his grace in effectual calling, effectual regeneration on certain pre-chosen individuals. Um, he's using, so he's, in other words, he's eisegeting the Old Testament in order to prove is apostolic interpretation of New Testament election, which is individual, unconditional election of the Calvinistic system. That's what I'm asking, is that on my interpretation, I don't have to use eisegesis of the Old Testament. I don't have to, I don't have to claim that Paul's using eisegesis of the Old Testament in order to prop up his apostolic interpretation of Calvinism. I can instead say what it meant then is the same thing that Paul's using it to mean. They mean the same thing in my interpretation. So doesn't it bear true, more true to say Paul is actually meaning what the text actually meant versus saying Paul is meaning something different than the Old Testament text actually meant? I'm just saying. Uh, I do believe that we as Christians must follow the apostolic interpretation of these texts. And so far, Professor Flowers, you have not even attempted to refute the exegesis I've provided 
of the apostolic interpretation of these texts. You've presented some other perspective, but you have not dealt with the apostolic interpretation that was provided, whereby you and can... By apostolic interpretation, he means Calvinism. Okay, so again, begging the question by assuming that the apostolic interpretation of the Old Testament is Calvinism. In other words, I'm reading the Old Testament text, I'm quoting from the Old Testament text, which clearly meant something completely different than individual effectual salvation um, of in, you know, for unconditional purposes, but that's the way I'm reading it, Paul to mean it, because that's the apostolic, that's the way he's using it, therefore it gives me authority to do the same thing. So because Paul's eisegeting the Old Testament, we can eisegete the Old Testament, because he's the apostle, so he's given the authority to eisegete the Old Testament. Why? You don't need to have a Paul eisegeting the Old Testament under our interpretation, so our interpretation is more likely the correct interpretation because it doesn't involve eisegesis of Old Testament text. Walk through Romans 9 and you can allow each step to build upon the other and you can walk all the way through. I didn't have to jump to Romans 11. I didn't have to jump out of Romans 9. I well, he started in Romans 8 and he did jump into Ephesians 1 at, at one point in his presentation and to 11 in, at one point in his presentation. Um, and referring to other text in order to help you interpret a particular text within the passage. It's not um, outside of hermeneutics. I mean, obviously, we allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. So ref referencing uh, Jesus's parable of Matthew 22 um, is a perfect parallel of what Paul is going through at this day and time. He's one of those messengers that were chosen to take the message to the highways and the byways, to the Jews first who were trying to stone him, and now to the highways and the byways. That's a perfect model of what's happening to Paul in his life. So why wouldn't we use that um, illustration of Jesus, that, that almost prophecy of what's coming? Uh, why wouldn't we use that to help us to interpret what's happening contextually within Romans 9 through 11 to understand the intention of the author? I could walk all the way through. You did well, not do that. Speaking of that, you have to switch your hermeneutic from the individualized approach in Romans 9, and it has to change to a corporate approach by the time you get to 11. Otherwise, you have those who are grafted in back in, and those who are stumbling haven't stumbled beyond recovery, verse 11. Those who um, have been cut off might be grafted back in, it says, if they leave their unbelief. And the reason they were cut off in the first place was because of unbelief, not because of something they did before they were ever born. So how do you explain okay, your transition? I, I, I reject, uh, everyone heard me clearly state, and I, maybe you just didn't hear it, everyone heard me clearly state that the presence of individual election does not in any way, shape, or form deny that there are not corporate aspects and Paul does, after chapter 10, shift to a discussion of specific, he says. So the, to individuals, the, to the, who stumbled, the individuals who stumbled weren't able to recover? All they right, were that is recover. time. Thank you. Oh, man. Wish we could have got to that answer because the, the same individuals, he always thought, oh, well, corpor corporations are involved with individuals too. You know, nations have individuals within them too. That's the answer Calvinists often give when coming to Romans 9. Okay, well, take that into Romans 11 and see what happens. The individuals who are being hardened in Romans 9 are the same individuals that Paul holds out hope that will be provoked to envy and saved in Romans 11. The same individuals who stumbled are the same ones that he said didn't stumble beyond recovery. They had to, in order to stumble, to not stumble beyond recovery, you have to admit those are the ones stumbling. So who are the ones stumbling? Those who are hardened, who are cut off. Those are calloused. But they have not stumbled beyond recovery. That means they can't be the reprobate, non-elect, eternally chosen for damnation individuals of the Calvinistic worldview. It just doesn't fit. The same ones who are cut off, spoken of in Romans 9, verses 1 through 3, that are that he's wishing he could cut himself off for their sake, he, they're the ones that he, he were cut off for unbelief in the first place and could be grafted back in if they leave their unbelief. Those are individuals. So the same individuals who are cut off are the same ones who could be grafted back in. So if you want to talk about nations being involved, uh, having individuals, then let's keep that interpretation and let's apply it all the way through Romans 11 and see how it works with your systematic it'll fall apart, as you well, I probably could see just in that, that little discourse. All right, very good. Okay, let's fast forward to the next point here. We have a, several questions regarding... Now he does, I think you get, an, if I take a minute, you get another minute, don't you? I don't know. Let's, let's get to as many as we can, so okay, let's just... Go ahead. Okay, okay, we'll just go ahead and jump right into the next one. Um, Professor Flowers, um, there were several questions regarding sin, original sin. Um, can you define, is sin inherited or original sin? out of Romans 9, or how would you see that? Yes. Um, the Baptist Faith and Message teaches that we are sin-stained or that we are born with a sin nature, um, that we are um, inclined towards sin, um, and that um, we do need a Savior. 
Um, even, even John Piper deals with this with regard to infants, for example, who die um, in the womb or uh, they die when they're young, about the, specifically with regard to Romans chapter 1, with men being without excuse or without the ability to answer for their, for their choices. And even, even John Piper takes the view that if they can't naturally have the ability to respond, then God won't hold them responsible in that way, and therefore he believes that infants who die will be saved. And he's dealing with the same issue that we all deal with, which Augustine was dealing with. That's what Pelagius and Augustine were mostly debating over was the infant baptism issue. And Augustine obviously did believe in infant baptism and the need for it in order to wash away this concept of original, original guilt, really, that you're born, in a sense, guilty for Adam's sin. There's so many passages in Scripture, Ezekiel, I think of, and several others that talk about us not being guilty because of the sin of our father. I think that's a, even just a natural understanding. We wouldn't think, okay, if my dad went out and killed somebody, I'm going to go to jail for it. I mean, that's just, a, again, it's a common understanding, a way of, of seeing this. However, the federal headship concept um, that is taught within Scripture does, in, in a sense, talk about how when Adam represented us in the garden, we do fall in the sense that, that all of us receive that sin nature and thus are fallen in Adam and thus need a Savior. But that does not mean that it's not equal to being unable to respond to a father who calls us and appeals for us to be reconciled from that fall. And so it's one thing to say I'm fallen. It's another thing to say I'm fallen and I can't even recognize that I'm fallen, nor can I respond to a father who lovingly calls me out of that fall and, and so that's the distinction, I think, between the Calvinists, in my view, is the, the total inability aspect of the total depravity. Okay, and it, uh, I rambled a little bit in that answer, I think. Um, I, I could have been clearer. But, um, but the point I'm really trying to indicate is that we can hold to a concept of depravity without necessarily holding to original guilt in specific. In other words, that we're being, we're being punished for another person's sin. Now, that doesn't mean there's not consequences. It, it's like he, he's about to go and give an example of some Old Testament people who, who their consequences of their sin affect their entire family. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, we're talking about individual being held morally guilty uh, in eternity with hell, by, the, by, the, by that definition, um, for the sins of somebody else in their family. And there's so many passages. I've got an article on the age of accountability that goes through this throughout the text where it teaches about how children aren't held accountable for their parents' actions and sin. Um, and so that, that's established well with regard to their guilt. But then there's also the distinction that we've already drawn out between the difference of man's depravity or sinfulness and man's responsibility uh, to God when he's calling them to repent from that sinfulness. And you can't just assume that because somebody's a slave to sin that they can't admit that they're a slave to sin and trust in the one who's offering a way out of that slavery, of, of freedom from that slavery. All right. Thank you. And Dr. White, one minute. It is not a matter of not being able to recognize you're fallen. The biblical teaching is that you love being fallen and that you cannot cease loving being fallen. So okay, it, so he just said the same thing. So you, you, you love being fallen by nature. In other words, you can't not love being fallen. You want to be fallen, and you can't, you can't admit that you're fallen. So it's like a, the alcoholic loves being an alcoholic, and because he loves being an alcoholic, he can't admit that he's an alcoholic and, and, and choose to check himself into a rehab facility, not until he's, his addiction's taken away. So you have to get the addiction taken away in order for you to admit you have an addiction. It's just, it's cart before horse, it's backwards. You've got to, you have, you have to, your sin addiction, your bondage to sin has to be taken away before you admit that you're in bondage to sin. It, again, non sequitur. Again, that's, that's a, I think, a problem. Romans chapter 5 makes it very, very clear that Adam is our federal head. It explains why death exists for all men, including infants. And well, you know, what kind of death we're talking about? We're talking about. I, I, I think it's pretty clear that when when Adam is his, he becomes uh, mortal. I mean, he he dies, and thus to get eternal life back, we have to believe. You have to have faith. You're being separated from God um, by being cast out of the garden. You don't have access to the tree of life anymore. Well, the only access to the tree of life now is through faith in Christ. But the Calvinist says. Well, because you don't have access to the Father anymore, you also don't have access even through Christ because you can't have Christ unless he effectually regenerates you first. And that's the, that's the problem with the, the Calvinistic worldview, again, is that, that same conflation. And if you reject the idea um, that, as Professor Flowers just said, well, you know, my daddy did something, I'm going to jail. It, he's used that illustration a number of times. And I just have to go, do you remember Aiken? 
Do you remember what happened at, at, at Jericho? Do you remember what happened at Ai? Um, who was punished for Achan's sin? Was it just Achan? Anybody remember? It was his whole family, his wife and his kids and his doggies and his kitties. Um, and so if you have a problem with that, you, you need to take it up with the, the fact that that's how God deals with his people. That's how God dealt with his people in that situation. And Okay, so if we're to be like God and justice is defined by God, and you, you're interpreting those texts that way, then why isn't Charles Manson's children and maybe even grandchildren and dogs and kitties all in the death chamber or at least in prison? So why, why don't you practice that? If you believe that's true justice, James White, why don't you carry that over in your actual practices? Do you, do you punish people around you, uh, your church? When you discipline people in your church, do you discipline the children of those in your church for the guilt of their parents? And if you don't, why don't you? Why aren't you consistent? Why aren't you like God? Why aren't you doing what God taught you justice is? Or could it be that you've misinterpreted those texts and that what he's actually talking about is that the, that the, the sins of the father can follow the children to, for, for generations because the effects, the consequences of sin can affect further generations and can affect children and other things. It's not that God is personally holding somebody accountable for the sin of the father as if they are guilty for the sin of the father, but know that there's consequence. Like the example that we've used before uh, with crack babies. A baby is born addicted to crack, not at his own fault. It's not, he's not guilty of being addicted to crack. He didn't take crack. He, he, he just inherited that from his mom who was, who, who was addicted to crack. So it's his mom's fault. She's guilty, but he has a consequence that affects him. Sin is the same way. We're born, at no fault of our own, under the condemnation of, of sin in a, in, a, in a world surrounded by with temptation and sin and, and, and the inclinations towards sin and the flesh and all of the things with a, a mortal body that will die because of Adam's sin. That doesn't mean we're guilty for what Adam did. There's a dis difference between those two things. And he doesn't seem to draw the distinction between those two things. And that's clearly what Romans 5 is teaching in regards to original sin. Very good. Thank you. Um, Dr. White, if man is totally depraved, why does God go to the trouble of redeeming him? Well, we have to define what totally depraved means. I think we've had some, some real misidentifications. Totally depraved does not mean that you do not respond to God. We believe that we respond to God. Okay, and, and I never accused being totally depraved in the Calvinistic system of saying you can't respond at all. What I'm saying is you can't respond positively. And I even put in that word willingly or positively over and over again. You can't willingly give your life. You can't follow him. You, you can only hate God. You can only love being fallen, as he said earlier. And so you can't willingly respond in a positive way is what I mean. Now, there may be times in which I slip when I'm trying to do it fast where I just say you can't respond. And I mean respond willingly or respond positively. And I don't say it every single time. But I've said it enough times for people to know exactly what I'm talking about when I said you can't respond positively or willingly to God's appeal to be reconciled from the fall. God, we just respond consistently according to our nature. We are the enemies of God. And therefore, for example, and do you have any control over that from birth? Or is that according to the decree of God under Calvinism? So in other words, what you've just explained is determinism. Mankind is born a hater and enemy of God by God's decree, not by his own choice. In other words, because of what Adam chose to do, the consequence of what Adam chose to do, God decreed for the consequence to be that all mankind under him would be born haters of God without the moral capacity to do other than hate God and reject his appeals for reconciliation. Come out and say that real clearly, and we'll all say, okay, that's Calvinism, so we can decide whether the Bible teaches that or not. But when you bury that underneath a lot of other vocabulary words and vernacular, sometimes people don't understand what you're saying. But you're just teaching determinism, that the nature you're born with is what's determining your actions, but the nature is controlled by God. God controls the desires. You can say, yeah, you're doing according to what you want, but who cares if you say you're doing according to what you want if God's controlling what I want? If God controls my wanter, then God's determining what my choices are. If wants determine your, your choices in that regard. And that's not freedom by any definition, as far as I can tell. Romans chapter 1 uh, says that we are katakantone. We are suppressing the knowledge of God. There's all sorts of different ways of doing that. Some people do that religiously. Some people do that through drugs. Some people do that through riches, sex, etc., etc. But the point is, we're acting consistently according to our nature. And as Jesus said in John chapter 8, you are, anyone who commits sin is the slave of sin.
He also says you, you as believers are slaves to righteousness. Does that mean that you can't be tempted by sin and desire to sin and choose to sin even as slaves to righteousness? It's not what it means, okay? Being a slave to something does not mean you can't admit or confess your slavery and, and admit that you, you're in bondage. It doesn't ever mean, it never means that, yet that's exact, continually, Calvinists make that same error over and over and over again. And, and they won't address the contention. They won't address that point of contention. They think by proving you're in slavery proves moral inability to confess otherwise. And it's just not there. And so you, you just simply have to answer the question, does the Bible mean what it means or does it not? If you can say that a heart of stone can voluntarily humble itself so as to be taken out, then I don't know what the, what the Bible's talking about and I don't know why Paul said those who are going to the flesh cannot do what is pleasing to God. I don't know any of that, but when you oh, I agree, he doesn't know, um, and that's that's the whole point. That's the problem. Is as Ezekiel says, turn from your wicked ways, and receive a new heart. It doesn't say I will give you a new heart so that you'll return to from your evil ways. That that's the order. And so I, I again, I, I don't know what the text means. If if it doesn't mean that you have to confess your sin in order to be forgiven, versus being reconciled from sin in order to confess that you need reconciliation, again, it's just a matter of the order salutis here. And when you've got pre-faith regeneration being asserted and not proven biblically, um, then then you have Calvinism. When you say if man's totally depraved, why would God redeem him? Because that's how God glorifies Himself. I mean, we are all. We are all, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. The, the, what the, the wonder of grace is not that it's given to the humble and to those who, who separate themselves from the crowd by doing what's right. The wonder of grace is that it's given to people like you and me. I mean, even <laughs> false dichotomy, as if you and me aren't people who separated themselves by humbly admitting that we needed a savior. I, again, who, whose responsibility is it for your response to God's appeal to be reconciled? Is, is God responsible for your response to his appeals? According to Calvinism, yeah. God's responsible for how you respond to his appeals to be reconciled. He's responsible either for your decree to be under Adam and thus a hater of God by nature and can't do otherwise, or he's responsible for whether he gives you a new heart, a new nature to where you will respond positively to him. It's really that simple. You're born unable to want God unless he wants you, and if he wants you, he'll make you want him. That's Calvinism in a nutshell. Even as believers, think of your own heart, even this day, and yet God has extended his grace to you even this day. God shows himself to be powerful in the salvation of a people that on any other basis are completely unsavable. So why would he save us? What does Ephesians 1 say? All to the, bra the praise of his glorious grace. That's the fundamental answer to, to a lot of questions, and it's a good answer. Thank you. P Professor Flowers, you have one minute. Humble people are no more worthy of being saved than unconditionally elected people. Did you catch that? People who are unconditionally elected under the Calvinistic system don't deserve salvation. People who humble themselves freely, libertarianly freely, don't deserve salvation either. So both need grace. Got it? The publican laid on the ground, tearing his clothes, saying, woe is me, I'm a sinner. And Jesus says, he went home justified. Therefore, humble yourself and you will be exalted. That was the conclusion of Jesus. That's Jesus' teaching, okay? Um, because he fell on the ground and humbled himself didn't make him deserve salvation. He didn't deserve, if it did, then there would be no reason for Jesus to die, okay? So he's still on the ground while he's tearing his clothes and ripping his clothes, saying, I'm a sinner, woe is me. That is a filthy rag. That's nothing. It means nothing. It, it, does, it deserves nothing. God chooses to show him mercy. He is just as undeserving, whether he's standing up on the street corner like the tax collector and praying a, a noble prayer of how great he is, or whether he's on the ground ripping his clothes, both of those individuals deserve condemnation because both have fallen short, both are sinful. Neither one have attained righteousness through works of the law. But because God's gracious, he chooses to show mercy to those who humble themselves. That's the teaching of Scripture. Scripture clearly teaches us the Lord sustains the humble but casts down the wicked to the ground, Psalm 147, 6. He mocks proud mockers but shows favor to the humble and depressed, Proverbs 3, 34. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land. You do what you, he commands, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps, perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. Matthew 18, 4. And the reason I emphasize the word perhaps there is to show that's God's choice, okay? 
humble yourself and perhaps is his choice. He didn't have to. He's not, he didn't owe you that. He didn't owe the prodigal son the, the golden ring or the fatted calf or the party. He chooses. He perhaps, if you return home from your pigs, he'll perhaps restore you. But that's his choice. Now, we know he will because of the promise, because of what he's promised in his good news. But the perhaps is to say that God's choice is to show mercy to the humble, to show grace to the humble, not that the mercy is owed to them because they're humble. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Luke 1, 52, he has brought down the rulers from their thrones. He has lifted up the humble. I could go on and on. There's three pages of verses like this. Humility does not earn righteousness. God gives grace to the humble because he's gracious and he chooses to do so out of grace, period. It's not notorious. Thank you. Professor Flowers, there's um, several questions regarding calling um, and the different types of calling, those calling to bring, call to bring the word, calling to salvation that you were talking about tonight. Um, can you define the calling specifically again out of Romans 8, 9, specifically 9? Sure. Um, again, I, I, think it, I think the way you illustrate it is you look at, for example, the parable that I referred to in Matthew 22, and it illustrates the different calls of God for the different purposes of God. Um, he calls some to be his messengers, and notice all the apostles are from Israel. He calls them from Israel for a reason, because Israel was chosen for that purpose. That's the promise of God that he made in Genesis 12, 3, that I will bless all the families of the earth through your seed. And so he has called a people from Israel to take the message to the rest of the world. That's a part of his calling to deliver his message. Okay, and so that relates directly to Romans chapter 9, verses 4 and 5 that we referenced earlier about the noble purpose, the honorable use for which God called out Israel. God's called them for that purpose. And that relates to the parable of those servants that he called to take the message to the world, like Paul would have been. So this is directly related to Romans 9. Romans 8 and into 9. Now, I didn't go and specifically quote from Romans 8 or quote from Romans 9, which is all that um, James White is going to focus on. Is he's going to try to ding me because I didn't reference directly to Romans 8 and Romans 9. But clearly, I'm referencing to Romans 8 and Romans 9 in the context of God's calling out of Israel for this honorable use, this honorable purpose. That's that first divine calling that I spoke of in my rebuttal. The second is that, it, it, again, it's another uh, unconditional choice that he takes it first to the Jew, but then he sends it to the Gentile. The Jews reject it, in a sense, and, the, and the, they, for the most part, they reject their own messengers. So that would relate to verse 6, is why they rejected it. If they're the chosen ones, then why have they rejected their own Messiah? So this is, again, directly related to my, to my interpretation of Romans 9. But yet, listen to how White replies to me. And so it goes to everybody. And the text specifically says... Take it to both those who are good and bad. So it's an unconditional choice to send it to everyone. In other words, don't just go to the, the rich or don't just go to the, the moral people. Don't just go to these people. Go to whoever. And notice he's also calling Paul, for example. He calls out Paul not because, for example, Gamaliel or some other Jew at that time or Pharisee was more moral or less moral. He doesn't call out his messengers because of their morality. He's calling them so that the purpose of God's election will stand. In other words, in order for his promise to be fulfilled in electing Israel to make sure his message is delivered because he doesn't break his promise. And so he's going to make sure that happens through Israelites. And so that's the calling he's talking about to get the word to the world. Now, whoever gets that message, the Ninevites get it from Jonah, who's, in a sense, compelled to go through normative means, big fish, blinding light for Paul, normative means, convince the messengers to go. Convincing the messengers to go through normative means does not prove that those who hear the message, some of them have been elected to get irresistible means to make them believe that message. And I think that's where Calvinists make them. Okay, so my regret in that is jumping from jumping analogies, okay? Um, and that, 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 that gets confusing for people who are watching from the outside, is that I'm jumping from analogy to analogy because my brain's racing through, you know, in the nervousness of a question answer, two minute time restraints. My brain's racing from different analogies. And so um, you always wish you could be more clear because you want people to understand what you're saying. And so being able to stop and take time now, you're able to explain. I was talking about the calling of Israel, obviously, and the fact that God would use persuasive means to make sure the reason he called out Israel would be accomplished, just as he called out his messengers to make sure the message was sent first to the Jew and to the Gentile. He's going to ensure that will happen. So there's that kind of calling. 
And there's also the kind of calling where we talk about all are called, but few are elect in the parable. And so you're, you're distinguishing between the call of the messenger versus the call of all who need to hear that message to respond. And that in distinction to the, the few who are elect, the few who are actually chosen to enter into the banquet, who are clothed in the righteousness of Christ through faith. And therefore all may believe through the calling of the messengers who were chosen and the message that goes out to all people. That's what I was trying to get to. Now I jump over to talk about Nineveh and Jonah again because I was trying to draw that back in. And I can see how somebody could hear that and go, ah, that's kind of confusing. I don't understand where you're going. And I was talking too fast and rambling a little bit. So uh, I do regret not being more clear on my answers, but it's clearly I'm directly talking about the interpretation of Romans 9, but yet listen to White's answer. All right, Dr. White, one well, minute. I thought that the question was asked, could you explain what calling is in Romans 9? I didn't hear anything about Romans 9, so let me just once again point. See, how he thinks that's not about Romans 9 is still baffling. Now, I may, you, may, you may disagree with my interpretation of Romans 9, that it's not about God calling out Israel for the purpose of, of bringing redemption through them. Um, the reason he chose Esau, I mean, chose Jacob over Esau, that, that all pointed out. Is you may not think that's, it's, that's the right interpretation, but to not think it's about Romans 9 is just, is just beyond the pale, I think. Point out to folks, uh, Romans 8.30, those whom he called, uh, these he also justified. The calling, therefore, is the effective call of God unto salvation itself. And, I, and I've got a broadcast and an article on Romans 8, which I don't think has anything to do with what he's talking about. And um, I quote from N.T. Wright and several other scholars that, uh, that share similar portions of my interpretation of, of Romans chapter 8, which I believe is more of a reference to, to Israel, again, uh, to, to those who uh, were foreknown, those formerly known in former times, not those foreseen throughout the future who are going to choose God like some Wesleyan Arminians may interpret it, or those foreknown in that they're pre-elected predestined, like the Calvinist seems to interpret it, but those who are formerly known, uh, the Israelites who were who loved God and followed him, that God has, 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 that's why he's speaking in past tense verbs, and he uses the word glorified, past tense. Um, doesn't make a lot of sense, though there's a rare use of the Greek to use past tense about things that are not yet but uh, predestined to be. It's a very rare use of the word, and more likely Paul's intention is speaking about those in the past, which again, you can go to my commentary to get more definition, but I didn't have time in a two-minute rebuttal to try to unpack all of Calvinism's baggage um, on top of Romans 8, 20, uh, 28 and following, so I didn't, um, but I do another broadcast if you're interested. Then that calling is seen in the elect of God in verse 33 of chapter 8. And then when you trace that through chapter 9, the conclusion then becomes, even we whom he called, not only from amongst Jews, but also among Gentiles, never has Professor Flowers shown us where that salvific calling to salvation and justification somehow gets shifted. Okay, and so when we talk about being called, um, Again, if you're talking about effectual calling, as the Calvinist presumes upon that word, it's a whole other thing than if you're talking about the general call of the parable of going to the highways and byways and call all to redemption. But there's also a sense in which we can talk about the called out ones and be talking about those as ones who responded to that call. Like I might say in, in an army situation, well, all those recruited will be trained. Okay, well, just because I say all those recruited will be trained doesn't mean that others weren't also attempted to be recruited. The recruiter might have tried to recruit a thousand people that day and only successfully recruited a hundred. So to say that those who are recruited were trained doesn't necessarily mean there was no more out there that were offered recruitment. It just is it's just a way of saying these are the ones who responded to the calling and the response is just implied within the word itself. And and sometimes Calvinists do that too, is that they they read effectuality into the word calling when obviously throughout scripture that's not ever what it says. Calling to salvation and justification somehow gets shifted so that it's no longer the consistent reading once we get to chapter 9 verse 24. It remains consistent. That doesn't mean that there's not a, a, a group of people, all the rest of these things, but if we're looking at Romans 9, it would help to actually go to Romans 9 to see what it says about that particular issue. Which we're in Romans 9 all the time. All Whether right, thank you. Recognize it or not. Dr. White, Romans 9 we had several who, who talked through this being 
not a very encouraging passage. Uh, one specifically asked about their friend who it breaks their heart, who's walked away from, from the faith. Can you just shortly maybe say how Romans 9 would be encouraging to people? Well, again, it's encouraging to people who have God's priorities. It's encouraging to people who okay. have God's And that's a question-begging comment, because it's assuming God's priority is Calvinism. Okay, so just so you're hearing that. Now, obviously, from his perspective, God's priority is to demonstrate his wrath and his power through the reprobate of the, the Calvinistic world, is that God is going to step on the reprobate. He's putting them down to demonstrate his power and his justice over them. And he's lifting up the elect, unconditionally chosen elect, to, to demonstrate how gracious and loving he is to those specially chosen. <clears throat> and if that's God's priority, then... You, you should you should love that and 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 therefore ultimately what he's saying if you believe Calvinism then you should think it's encouraging because it's Calvinism and Calvinism's true and so it's just kind of a circular kind of begging the question kind of argument that he's making but just just so you recognize it God's priorities it's not encouraging to people who have human priorities and by human priorities he means non-Calvinism so again just begging the question so he, he's assuming that it, you, you, Leighton must be wrong because his priorities are human not biblical but again, that's the very point up for debate. Remember what I said. Remember, look at, look at what, what is said. In order that I may make known the riches of the glory of my glory upon vessels of mercy. God has a purpose in revealing to us who he is. And the priorities that are laid out in Romans 9 is God demonstrates his power and he makes his wrath known. Let's be honest. If we asked evangelicals today, how many of you on your list of priorities is the making known of God's power and the demonstration of his wrath, does it ever appear on your radar at all, let alone it's in the top 10? Let's be honest. This is what my closing gets into, is that the namby-pamby, easy believism, chicken soup for the soul, pop psychology of the Joel Osteens of the world is oftentimes equated with all non-Calvinism. And I was trying to point out men like Tozer and others did teach the wrath of God and the full weight of, of God's wrath while not holding to a Calvinistic soteriology. So it's kind of the setting up a false dichotomy that either you believe in uh, wrath and you teach the whole counsel of God's word um, and, and therefore you're a Calvinist or you're not. You're one of those free willy um, namby pamby guys over there on the other on the other aisle and, that, and that's again what he's trying to paint us all as being in that that namby pamby category that didn't like to focus on the wrath of god or the full counsel of god's word and that of course is, is just a false dichotomy and, and untrue we never even think about it and my suggestion is until we have the biblical mindset that paul demands that we have which he provides to us by his old testament citations and until our heart beats for the demonstration of God's glory. And folks, God's wrath is a part of God's glory. Because if you look at the cross, and if you don't see the wrath of God against sin at the cross, you're not really seeing the love of God there either. You see a very trunk. Again, we'd all agree that God's pouring out his wrath on his son for the sins of all men at the cross. And so even a bigger demonstration of wrath on our view and a bigger demonstration therefore of his love and provision on our view a limited one on theirs Cated, very shallow view of the cross if you don't see the reality of god's wrath the necessary wrath that is his against sin and so the point is if we have that mindset then what romans 9 tells us is God will accomplish the means by which he has said he will glorify himself, the triune God. And that is our confidence. All right, thank you. Professor Flowers, one minute. I think Romans 9 through 11 is very encouraging because it's an example of God cutting off people who are already hellbound. They're heading for hell because they're self-righteous. They're going that way. And it, just like a parent who has a rebellious child, sometimes you give them that advice. You can't enable them anymore. You've got to cut them off. It's almost like what um, Paul uh, gives illustration of is pushing out that rebellious believer. Why? So as they may save their soul. What's he talking about? I'm pushing them out so as that they might be provoked to envy. They might see the, the Gentiles coming to faith. They see that prostitute's life change, and now she's a mother of, of kids, and she's a faithful wife. 
life and she's changing. And these hardened Jews, seeing this, they're provoked. Where otherwise, if God just left them alone, they were hellbound because they were in their hardened condition. But by hardening them, he's actually showing them grace. He's hardening them for the purpose of bringing them redemption. That's the encouragement here of this passage. It's all about God's grace. From the very first three verses to the very end, it's about his grace. Which is what Romans 11.32 says. He's bound them all over disobedience so as to show mercy to them all. Okay, so this is about a widening of God's mercy and grace, that those he's cut off in Romans 9 are the ones who have have stumbled but not beyond recovery in chapter 11. Yeah, they've, they've been cut off, but they may be grafted back in if they leave their unbelief. So this is about a widening of his mercy. Even those who are hardened and and broken, there is still an opportunity for them to be saved if they leave their unbelief. And that's why we know this is not Calvinism, because under Calvinism, the reprobate would have no hope of being grafted back in because they were already chosen for reprobation for no apparent reason before they were ever born. And that's how we know that Paul wasn't intending Calvinism, because if you read on into 10 and 11, he clearly denounces that kind of um, interpretation by saying that those who stumbled have not stumbled beyond recovery. Those who have been uh, hardened may be provoked to envy and saved, uh, verse 14 of chapter 11. Uh, Those who have been cut off for unbelief may be grafted back in if they leave their unbelief. Those are all indications that Paul is not talking about uh, individuals being reprobated for before the foundation of the world for no apparent reason. And that's, again, one of the fault lines of the Calvinistic interpretation. Thank you. Professor Flowers, we have several regarding your statement uh, about faith and works and also how that the question is between how did Romans 9 with Pharaoh did he actually it was there not faith before or whatever so we're gonna I'm gonna kind of combine them and here's your question Um, does election precede birth or is it faith through works Um, God has elected certain individuals to carry out his promise, like we talked about with Paul. There is a sense in which God has obviously elected the nation of Israel unconditionally, but he has elected the plan for bringing redemption so that whosoever believes will be saved. So in the parable again, those who show up clothed in the righteousness of Christ, again, many are called, few are chosen. Who are the ones who are chosen? The ones who show up in faith. And so his election is to elect a people to bring the message so that whosoever, it's, it's a provisional atonement. He's providing this to the entire world. That's why it's good news. It's because it's given to all mankind for all to respond either in faith or in disbelief. They can, trade, they can choose to trade the truth in for lies, and they're held responsible for that. Why? Because they're actually able to respond. If they're born unable to respond, there's no real basis. Now, when I say born unable to respond, again, that's one of the, the times where White will jump on me. We're not saying they're unable to respond. We're, un- we're saying they're unable to respond positively. Well, that's, that's what I'm meaning, okay? They're unable to respond positively to God's appeals because they're enemies of God by nature, under God's decree, from the f- foundation of the world where they could not do otherwise. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're critiquing. So just to be clear on that point. And I'm also pointing out the differences of what God's electing. There's several choices of God. Don't just you don't hear the word elect and just think one choice. There's only one choice. Chosen individuals for effectual salvation for no apparent reason. It's not what what Paul's meaning. There's several choices God makes in his redemptive history. And you have to understand what those different choices are, what the different ways in which he's accomplishing his redemption, like he promised Abraham, through your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So I've chosen you in your seed to bring a blessing to the rest of the nations. So that's, that's God's purpose in electing Israel. And that will stand. And God will individually also choose whosoever believes, whether Jew or Gentile, regardless of the nation, he has chosen that whoever believes in him puts their trust in him it's through the promise, through faith, that one is reconciled. It's on which to hold somebody truly response-able. The very ability to respond in Romans 1, for example, is what shows us Um, our accountability or our culpability for the sins and our choices that we make. And so I think the Calvinist undermines that by teaching that mankind, most of mankind is born in this condition that they can't respond to God at all. That even when he sends a gracious appeal, a gospel appeal that says, come to me, they, they can't willingly come. See, notice there, I said they can't willingly come. They can't want to come, okay? They're enemies of God. They will hate it. But yet listen to the rebuttal. That he'll continue to highlight, oh, no, they can respond. They can respond. 
They just can't respond willingly. They can't want to come. And that's the whole point. Instead of answering that, he just keeps correcting that same misnomer as if I don't understand it already. And so you're giving them the perfect excuse. You're giving, you're taking away ultimately their responsibility for that. And, and I think that that's really important to understand because the election has to do with God's plan for bringing redemption to the world and also his choice of those who come in faith, those who, again, like I said before, humble themselves. All right, time. Dr. The, White. The direct statement of Scripture, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, the direct object. Yeah, he chose us. Who's us? Look back at verse 1 and 2, Dr. White the faithful in Christ Jesus. That's who he's addressing. That's who's, uh, that's who's us, okay? So when he's saying he's chose us in him, it's not saying he's chosen us, certain lost individuals, to be in him by effectual means, which is what you're reading onto that, but he's chosen us, the faithful in him. So us are those who are in Christ through faith. That's who us is, us in him. Not he's chosen certain us's to be in him through effectual means. And that's the, again, the assumption of the Calvinist on that reading. The act of choosing is not Jesus. It is us. We are chosen in him, but we are the direct object of that choosing. So Right, and so is the person who walks up clothed in the righteousness of Christ the direct object of his choice, the few who are elect? Yes, but they're elect in him because they are clothed in his righteousness. See, they're in Christ. That's why they're chosen. So they're not chosen to be in Christ as if the election happened prior to them coming clothed. They're clothed, and therefore they are elect. So that's, that's the point. Yes, they're chosen, but they're chosen in Christ. And it's because they're in Christ that they're chosen. That's what the, the choosing and selection is. It is completely untrue that we are giving anyone an excuse. Jesus himself said, if you sin, you're the slave of sin. Was Jesus giving somebody an excuse? Oh. Slave of sin does not give you an excuse for admitting and confessing your slavery and bondage to sin when he calls you to repent of that bondage and slavery to sin. Again, same conflation, over and over and over agnosium in every single discourse from Calvinists. I've not seen any Calvinists take the time to stop and explain. Okay, we admit, Leighton, we're not being very clear in the distinction between being a slave to sin and morally incapable of admitting our slavery and trusting in the one who offers us freedom from it. But I would love to hear Calvinists actually engage with that. Oh, well, you know, I'm just slave of sin, so I can just do whatever I want to do. You think God's going to accept that? We're not giving anyone an excuse at all. I really honestly believe that that is a red herring and a canard that needs to be dropped if this, if this discussion is going to move forward. That is an appeal to emotion. It is a misrepresentation of the other side. It's been made many times this evening. I've tried to overlook it. It was just made again, and I'm going to point it out. It's a canard. Let's drop it. All right. Thank you. Dr. White. Oh, and that's when you wish you had time to actually sit down and have a discussion, because then I could actually say, wait a second, it's not a canard, and it's not a, a, a misapplication. It gets to the very heart of this very issue. And, and then we could have an actual discussion and debate versus being cut off by clocks so much right did jesus die for the sin of everyone or just the chosen two minutes what did the death of jesus christ accomplish what is the purpose of the atonement i am i am absolutely unashamed to say that the death of jesus christ accomplishes exactly what god the father god the son and god the holy spirit intended it to accomplish and we would too we would say it, it absolutely accomplished what it intended to accomplish. So the question is, what did it intend to accomplish? The salvation of pre-chosen, unconditionally chosen um, individuals, effectually regenerated, or was the intention to provide salvation for every man, woman, boy, and girl, so that whosoever believes would not perish but have everlasting life? What is the intention of the atonement? And I do not believe that Jesus Christ has ever failed to save anyone that he has desired to save. He is a person. And that, and that position is actually, I'm not calling him a hyper-Calvinist. That's actually, is actually consistent with hyper-Calvinism, though, because it undermines the well-meant offer. Because a, a lower form of Calvinist, like a David Platt, Matt Chandler, um, th those kinds of lower Southern Baptist kind of Calvinists, J.D. Greer would be in this category, they would say, no, God genuinely desires the salvation of all people. Whereas, whereas White holds to a higher, almost hyper form of Calvinism, 
where he said, no, no, whoever God desires for salvation will directly be saved because that's that salvific. This is where you get to the two wills of God. That that prescriptive will is that, yeah, he kind of offers salvation to everybody. He commands everybody to repent, but he doesn't really want that. You know, so- sovereignly, his secret will is only for the, the ones he's elected to be to be saved. Those are the ones he really wants to be saved. And so that's why when he says things like, God, if God desires for somebody to be saved, they will be saved. That's actually a, a form of or a tenet of hyper Calvinism that undermines the well meant offer of the gospel. Perfect Savior, Hebrews chapter seven says, because he ever lives to make intercession for them, he is able to save them to the uttermost. Now, if the idea is, well, you first have to humble yourself, you have to first do this, and then Christ has made you savable, that's not what the argument of the book of Hebrews is. The ar- okay, and here, he gets a lot into this in the atonement uh, debate, where it's either Christ came to save or make you savable. That's a false dichotomy, because both are true. He came to make all men savable, and he came to save whosoever believes. So it's actually saving whoever puts his faith in Christ, and he's made all men savable by providing the means for all men's salvation so that all are without excuse. And therefore, to, to set it up to say, oh, well, Jesus either came to make people savable or he came to actually save people is a false dichotomy. Nobody will, nobody will believe that. And David Allen and I went over that in one of our previous episodes, episodes, if you're interested. The argument of the book of Hebrews is, by one sacrifice he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. That is the work of Jesus Christ. And there is perfect unity between the decree of God the Father to save a specific people, the Son dies to redeem that people, the Spirit comes and applies that work and saves that people, and it's all to His glory. I do not believe that there is any meaningful way of defending the idea that the atonement of Jesus Christ simply makes men savable. There is all the world indifference, my friends, my brothers and sisters, in saying that Jesus Christ saves and saying that Jesus Christ makes savable. Those are not the same statements. False dichotomy. And I do not believe the one glorifies God. Jesus Christ is a perfect savior because he ever lives to make intercession. Ask yourself a question. Is Jesus Christ interceding in heaven today for those who are lost? Did he fail? If so, why? That's the question. Thank you. Professor Flowers, one minute. He not only makes them all savable, he certainly saves anyone who believes. 1 John 2.2, 2, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 Timothy 4.10, for we have put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all men and especially of those who believe. But... I think that that the point here that needs to be made is what kind of atonement is made. I believe in what's called a provisional atonement, which is best illustrated with the serpent that's lifted on the pole, which Jesus refers to in John chapter 3. The serpent lifted on the pole, if you look to it as a snake-bitten Jew, if you look to the serpent lifted on the pole, you would be healed. That's a provisional atonement. So nobody could die from snake venom and say, oh, I died only from snake venom if I refuse to look at the snake on the pole. If you refuse to look at the snake on the pole in faith then you're dying not only of snake venom, but you're also dying because you refuse to take advantage of the provision that's provided for them to have healing from that venom. So to use his false dichotomy, as earlier said, um, are all the Jews healable? Yes, by the serpent lifted up on the pole. All of them are healable. But are all healed? No, only those who look to the provision are healed. Are they actually healed? Yes, so there's actual healing. Just like there's actual salvation in our view, there's actual healing. But it's provision. It's a provision provided for the whole that only benefits those who actually look in faith to that provision. That's Jesus' analogy, and therefore it must be a good analogy of the provision of Christ's atonement. Thank you. Professor Flowers, um, there's several questions regarding humbling and your understanding of humbling. And the question would be, how would you talk through humbling when somebody is actually um, a Gentile? hardening, uh, Pharaoh being hardened. So how would they be able to humble themselves and explain the humbling process that you're saying they're able to humble themselves when they were hardened? Can you talk about that? Yeah, God, godly sorrow brings repentance. And so when God's word is preached, when God's word is spoken, the law, what's the law for? It's a tutor. It's a schoolmaster. 
And what's its purpose? Is it is its purpose to save? No, we know it's not its purpose to save. What is its purpose? To reveal our need for Christ. For, to reveal the fact that we can't earn our own righteousness. That's its purpose. Our, and Calvinists are trying to say, at least I think by implication of total inability, that the law can't do that. The law can't even reveal your need. It can't even make you realize you need it. Not unless you get a regenerated heart by irresistible means. But the law was sent for the purpose, and the gospel along with it, is sent for the purpose to help you to realize you're fallen. And then secondly, God wants you to be saved. He wants you to repent and to come to him. And so humility comes from recognition of our sin. It comes from the pigsty of our lives. It comes from that time when we get to the end of our rope and we say, I can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't live this life anymore. And you can choose to pull yourself up by the bootstraps and find another job. And I'm not going to go home and beg my daddy for a job. I'm going to make my way out of this pigsty. And you can harden your heart. And, the, and Hebrews chapter 3 warns you, don't allow your heart to grow hardened. Because if you think you can do it in the flesh and you think you can do it yourself, your heart will go more and more calloused. And eventually you won't even hear the revelation of God anymore. You won't hear his laws anymore. You won't hear the gospel anymore because your heart has grown calloused to it. That's what it's talking about here. So the humility that comes, the, and that's why I think Jesus even says uh, about a child, he pulls up a random child, he says, you have to become like this to enter the kingdom of heaven. What's the difference? If a child is totally depraved from birth, just like anybody else is, total inability, why point to a child? A child is humble. They're, they're not hardened in their rebellion yet. They're still willing to respond and to listen and to hear the word. And so when someone is hardened, it takes a lot more to get through to them. I think we could all experience that. And that's, that's the concept of, of, I think, humbling yourself to admit that you are a sinner. All right, time. Dr. White, one minute. I, I think I just heard someone say that children are humble. Yeah, Jesus did. <laughs> Humble yourself like this child, Jesus said. So I, I wish I would have said that and replied. <laughs> said, I said, relatively speaking, yeah, a child is more humble than the hardened uh, Pharisaical Jew that he was being compared to. Comparatively. Comparatively. Mm, okay. I'm just going to let that one stand as its own refutation. And So Jesus refuted himself? Jesus is the one that said, Humble yourself like a child. So instead of answering my debate, he refutes Jesus himself instead of answering the point of the debate. Uh, just, just, just saying. Um, move on from there. Um, Romans chapter 8 uh, has been quoted a number of times. Those who are in the flesh are not able to please God. They are not able to submit themselves to... Th as opposed to those who are indwelled by the Spirit. Those are the two people be being compared. Those who are indwelled by the Spirit versus those who are not indwelled by the Spirit. Even on Calvinism, one is not indwelled by the Spirit until they have faith. Okay, so if that's the proof text you're going to use, it doesn't work because there's nothing in that text that talks about how one goes from being unindwelled to being indwelled. It just simply is con contrasting the two. Those who are in the realm of the flesh, those with their minds set on the flesh, can't please God. It has nothing to do with whether one can respond willingly, positively to the call of the Spirit. And that's the problem with using that as a proof text. It is a very vague proof text to prove and debase an entire systematic of theology. But yet, that's the only thing he referred to in this whole debate to support this concept of total inability, which is virtually, again, the same condition of a judicially hardened Israelite. Through the law of God, something has to happen first. The Son has to set you free. And how does he do that? It's called the gospel, the power of God into salvation. So how can one believe in one whom they've not heard? Well, he brings more light, he brings more revelation. And so that's the prevenient grace, if you will, is God's light of revelation. He brings the truth. He brings revelation. He brings light so that people may know his, his desire for them to be saved. Um, and so, you know, yeah, he, do, he does need to do something first. We just think what he does first is sufficient without some effectual, irresistible, regenerative work. This is the difference between this, folks, this was the issue of the Reformation. I'm on Luther's side. He's on Erasmus's side. That's all there is to it. This was the uh, actually, I'm Balthazar Hubmeyer's side, um, who believed in the liberty of the will as well as Christian liberty and religious liberty. You, you believe you shouldn't torture people to death that disagreed with you, unlike Luther and Zwingli and uh, Calvin at the time, and, um, and held to believer's baptism, by the way. So if, I, if I'm going to be compared to somebody of those days, I would be compared to um, Balthazar Hubmeyer. Thank you very much. The issue of the Reformation, this, is, this fundamentally impacts how you will proclaim the gospel and how you'll present it to people. That's why this is something, is a discussion that we need to be, we need to be having. No question about it. 
All right, men, it is coming time to close. I would like to add one last uh, kind of closing statement for both of you if you want to kind of wrap up. But here's what I would ask as we kind of wrap up is how do we walk out of here? Um, Obviously, we're on different sides. We have some different thoughts, different philosophies. It even impacts the way we minister. How do we walk out of here? Are we still partners in the gospel or is there some way help tie this together? Because I'll be real honest, I'm a pastor. And so you're in the church here, and I'm sitting here going, uh-oh, we've got to be able to work together because I have people on different sides even in, in this church. And so the question becomes, how do we actually walk out of here to working together? Is there a way to do this? So can you at least tie this together, your closing remarks, and just kind of do that? We'll give you two minutes each. How do we work together? So Dr. White, would you start? Oh. We cannot sweep these things under a rug um, because it does fundamentally impact how we present the gospel. It has, I am an elder in a church. Um, I have been a hospital chaplain. This impacts how I did my work as a chaplain. It impacts how I do my work as an apologist. Um, And that what it means then is that we, instead of viewing this as a divisive issue that needs to be put in the corner, uh, need to address it, and I think address it even more deeply than we did this evening. Now, Professor Flowers uh, will agree. He started off his statement by saying, we can't sweep these things under the floor, we, under the carpet. We cannot ignore them. We cannot come up with political answers to these things. We do have to uh, continue the conversation. And for example, on the issue of the atonement or uh, things like that, every single generation has had to face these issues. And the only people that didn't face these issues uh, suffered greatly when they ignored it. The the gospel and the interest in the gospel and and the zeal for the gospel died in those generations. And so if you're asking, well, can we just set these things aside and and call them, um, you know, adiaphora, the the non-essentials? Um, No, I think it's been very clear. This does touch on the very nature of the gospel, and that means the dialogue needs to continue. And in what way? With a firm commitment to lay our traditions on the table and be willing to examine them fully on the basis of Scripture and to abandon them when they are seen to be unscriptural. There's no other way forward for people who truly believe the Bible to be the Word of God. Professor Flowers, two minutes. My best friend in the world is Calvinistic. Um, I've got family members in my inner family who are also Calvinistic and yeah we have heated debates and go back and forth back and forth and we enjoy each other but we walk away brothers and we love each other we do ministry together we do evangelism events together Um, and I think we can work together as brothers in Christ now I I agree with what he's saying that we need to address these matter of fact I think the reason the rise of Calvinism personally is because our side isn't addressing it they're skipping over Romans 9 they're not talking about these things and that's why I think it's resurging um, and so I think it needs to be addressed. I think people in the pulpit need to address these hard doctrines. They need to understand what predestination means. You need to understand what election means. You don't just sweep it under, I don't believe in election. Well, you gotta, if you believe Paul, you've got to believe in election. If you believe Paul, you've got to believe in predestination. If you're a Bible-believing person, you've got to believe these views. And so we can't continue with namby-pamby, easy believism and just, hey, let's all get along and, and come together and just pat each other on the back. D- dig deep and go deeper. And, and I, I thank Dr. White when I walked in because he's, he's pushed me in these last several months in preparation as iron sharpening iron to go into the word a lot deeper than I would have otherwise. That's what iron sharpening iron is. Even from the Calvinistic perspective, there's a reason God must have ordained for Arminians to exist. Why? Maybe to sharpen some of you Calvinists. You see what I'm saying? We need to sharpen each other, to love each other, to push each other. There has to be a reason us non-Calvinists are here. And maybe that's it. Just to make you think a little bit harder, to push you a little bit deeper. Uh, and I didn't hit it on this here, but... Um and that's true. If all things have been ordained by God, then God has ordained Arminianism and traditionalism. Um, and and th- that's a hard issue, I think, for Calvinists, because ultimately either I'm right and I'm standing in defense of God's glory or God has determined for me to be wrong for the praise of his glory. Either one of those is true. One, one of those has to be true. And so if, if I'm wrong, it's because God has ordained for me, for whatever reason, for me not to quite see sociology the way you see it. He's ordained and decreed for me not to be able to be able to understand Calvinism the way you do and sociology the way you do. And so it really comes back down to why, why has God ordained that? Why has God decreed for us to exist? And so Calvinists have to really grapple with that question. Uh, you know, that's, and that's what we need to be about. I want to close by saying this. I just asked Keith a little bit ago if we could do this. Um, another way that we can support each other is by helping each other's ministries. And if you can promise that you will not use money against 
the non-Calvinist, and use it in your Islamic work. If you can promise to do that, I would like for us to take an offering for um, <laughs> Alpha Omega Ministries tonight. And, uh, and, and I would like for you to do that as a free will offering. Um, <laughs> you know, so I, so I just put that in there. Um, well, I, uh, I very much appreciate that. Uh, I, and anyone who'd like to help us to uh, reach out to Muslims in South Africa this, this, this coming uh, October, that would be wonderful. But I really don't think it would be appropriate to do that as a part of this debate. Uh, I, I think you can go to aomin.org. You can find uh, soteri soteriology, soteriology 101 as well. Uh, but I think it would be inappropriate to ask you to do that in this context. Uh, I really do. That, that's up to Dr. Marion. He's got a, he's got a um, offering bucket in the back we already set up because I wanted to be able to support your ministry. And you, you, oh, he didn't ask, that. guys, he did not ask for a thing. He didn't ask to sell anything. He just wants, he just wanted to talk to the scripture. I'm just the world's I, worst marketer. Don't I, give me any more credit. <laughs> <laughs> now, as, as fun as that sounded, like, and I was honestly just trying to help him out because he's about to go on a trip to the Islamic world to, to do some apologetics work that I really love and I'm supporting. That's what, it was all a good spirit and good love. Um, right after that, I was attacked by uh, Red Grace, the guy that put this on, about, um, about saying, how dare you, you know, uh, limit where he could spend his money or say that you can't, um, you know, speak out against non-Calvinists or something like that. And it's just, so I was even well on for that. And I was, <laughs> I was honestly just trying to be nice. And that was uh, another part of the controversy. But nevertheless, that's all the theology part of it. And uh, so hopefully, Mark, that gives you some more clarity as to how you, you know, follow that back and forth uh, within the, uh, the back and forth answer and question. And a after even reading, going back over that and looking at it myself, there's a lot of parts that I think, yeah, you know, I was accused of being confusing at times, and I could see that. I, I can see now, listening back over, I know what I was thinking, because it's me, obviously, and I know where I'm coming from. And people who listen to me regularly probably knew where, you know, when I was jumping analogies, what I was talking about. But yeah, um, I talked too fast on certain point, points and um, may have uh, jumped too many analogies in order for people to follow where I was going. And I wish I'd have been clearer on that. So maybe this is, will help those who are legitimately and genuinely seeking right answers to know what the scriptures actually say, because that's really needs to be where our goal is, not who, who uh, looked more calm and, and composure. I mean, clearly, I think Dr. White looked more composed and um, like he'd been there before. I think 183 other debates prepares him for that. He for sure is more composed. But as far as giving substance of answers, I just don't see it. I don't see how he's really gauged with our points of contention, as I think evidenced by the fact that he was still never able to give a distinction with the difference between a judicially hardened Jew in the time of Paul and the, the totally depraved, the natural uh, son of, and daughter of Adam, um, because he's never been able to show a, a difference with a, a distinction between the condition of the heart of those two individuals within the Calvinistic worldview. I think that's where the debate is won or lost. And uh, he never answered that. So hopefully this has been helpful. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.